there's a genetic propensity, which again, but if two thirds of the women, there's again, going to be 152.8 million people that have Alzheimer's dementia by 2050, Mm. what are the influences? So for, you know, according to the CDC, when we talk about exercise, which I think is really important work, we always talk about muscle health and exercise as it relates to um, looking good, being jacked, but it is so much more valuable than that. And probably nothing creates more influence. 50% of Americans do not work out. 50%. Yeah. That's a lenient number too. Yeah, They're... I completely agree. Yeah. And roughly 72% do not meet the standards of the baseline recommendations, which are five days a week or, uh, you know, 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity plus two days a week of doing some kind of resistance training. Mm -hmm. What impact does exercise have on the brain? And is there a difference between cardiovascular exercise or resistance training? Mm. Because if we already know that the majority of the population isn't even meeting the baseline recommendations. Yeah, and this comes into public health policy, which is something I'm advocating strongly for. Let's look at why. Let's, Let's categorize exercise into three buckets. You've got aerobic training, you've got resistance training, and then you've got cognitive training. We'll go into all of them. We have seen in the last 30 years, we've seen a huge push for cardiovascular training. Why is that? Well, first and foremost, it's easy. It's the first the, the first interventions to be studied and funded in mice back in 1960 when we first realized the role of BDNF, which we'll go over. I also think that it's a it's so much more accessible to people. Cardiovascular activity. Cardiovascular activity, because you can just get outside, you can run. I think the, the nomenclature around resistance training becomes very intimidating, especially among women. I mean, you and I don't fall in this category. I've been you know, weight training my entire life, so I'm not never worried at the gym, but I do know that there are many women who are intimidated to go to the gym and lift weights. If you were to pick one thing, if you were to say, okay, I, and this is a hard question and we don't have to pick one thing, but if you were to have, if you were going to choose between cardiovascular activity, resistance training, high intensity interval training, what would you say seems to be the most efficacious for brain function? Oh, yeah. You're putting me in such a bad spot. I mentioned that I'm currently doing my doctorate and it is really much focused on resistance training and cognitive decline. However, I would I would definitely not consider HIIT training mm-hmm. in that. I would strongly look at, at minimum, four hours a week of aerobic mm. and at minimum, three days a week of resistance training. And have you thought about the mechanisms as to why? Yes. So let's look at cardiovascular training. There's so many benefits here. What's the first thing that your brain needs to survive? It needs adequate blood flow, correct? How do we get blood flow to the brain? Well, we know that every time our every time we push blood through our aorta, we've got the carotid arteries, carotid arteries which supply the frontal part of the brain with blood. We've got the vertebral arteries supplying the back end or the posterior part of the brain. So your brain needs blood flow to survive. We get this predominantly from aerobic training because every time we move our body, we're pushing blood. But not just that, you're getting the cardiac remodeling. And a lot of people, I guess when we talk about, you know, you talk to neurologists and cardiologists and they'll fight. The the brain's more important. No, it's the heart. And there Imagine is a, what happens when you talk to the urologist. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and you've got <laughs> we this. We know what's most important to them. Yeah. And you've got this synergistic relationship between the two. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Because when you remodel the cardiac system, when we improve left ventricular or the left ventricle of the heart, which, mm. which supplies the body with blood, you're getting a better profusion of blood. You're becoming more efficacious with your blood flow. It becomes more efficient. You become stronger. Therefore, as you get older and we see these age-related defects in the heart, Mm. we get left ventricular stiffness. We get stiffening of the arteries. You can actually change that, remodel the heart so it is fitter and it is stronger and you can pump more blood to the brain. 
So you you do like cardiovascular training, which is which is wonderful, and obviously it's very well studied. Very well studied. Does it matter the intensity someone is increasing the blood flow, and is there a dose dependent relationship? So you said four hours of aerobic activity. Is that pretty safe to say um, it could be less if the intensity is higher, or is there some a time component, like a dose dependent? component. Yeah. In fact, the studies, and this is what I found in the paper that we collaborated on, it said that um, minimum three three hours. Um, I lobby against that. I, I lobby against <laughs> these CDC guidelines all the time, which are recommending 150 minutes to 300 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. If you were to tell my mother that, she'd say, what are you talking about? Absolutely. So the nomenclature needs to change. Now, in exercise physiology, we learn about zones. We've got zone one, which is we're sitting down right now in zone one. Zone two is where I think we should all be training at. I can't see actually why we need to dip into the zone four for more than 35 minutes a week. There are so many people right now I'm seeing on social media hitting the gym, doing hit training, getting into zone four, zone five, whatever zones you want to work in. Zone four, let's just call that your maximum. They're beating at zone four every single day and they're seeing diminishing returns. You don't like that? No, I don't see why you need to do that. However, but is there any downside? Well, I mean, you overtraining. You'd probably, you've got the mental component where you feel like, oh my God, it's just too hard to get up every day. You know this with your patients. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest behavior change? It's something that someone can put into place every day, right? If we're going to get behavior change, we need to fit it to something, a protocol or administer something where somebody can do it every single day. Not just that, the only reason why I think this is problematic Let's talk about the positives of it. So maximal aerobic exercise. Um, Dr. Ben Levine, he's a, a cardiologist, phenomenal, mm. phenomenal physician. He did a study where he took 53 50 year old, 50 year olds and he subjected them to maximal aerobic activity. I think it was around three to four hours a week. He measured their heart. He did EKGs. He looked at their entire heart, looked at what was happening. Now, I mentioned earlier that as we age, we see a stiffness in the arteries. We also see left ventricular hypertrophy. So the left ventricle, it becomes thicker. So if that becomes thicker, there's a smaller space for the heart to pump blood to the rest of the body. The right ventricle supplies the, the lungs with deoxygenated blood. So what he saw over the course of two years, he reversed the age-related decline in the heart. He saw that these 50-year-olds that came in with a 50-year-old heart, once scanned again after that protocol with just two years, he reversed the heart-related decline by 20 years. So mm. these 50-year-olds had 30-year-old hearts. Mm. And do they just define that with stroke volume, blood pressure? Stroke How volume, blood pressure, um, left ventricular hypertrophy decreased. So he was opening up the left that's ventricle. That's interesting. Okay. Oh, you should see the actual MRI yeah, photos that's interesting. of it. Yeah. And how long did that take? Two years. Took two years. Yeah. Of, of maximal training. That seems like a lot. Three to it four is. hours. Three to four hours a week. Yeah. For two years. For two years. 50 year olds. At, yep. Yeah at that zone four. And by the way, for everybody listening, when I talk about zone four, uh, I'm generally talking at around 85 to 90% of your maximum heart rate. That's hard, right? Sounds like a good time to me. Now, what are yeah. you not getting? Have you done a VO2 max test? No, Okay. my husband has. Well, I'm gonna have to, we're gonna have to do one. But what you see is people who are less metabolically efficient will get on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. And once they start running, they go from zone one, obviously sedentary, those who are less metabolically efficient go from zone one to zone three to zone four. They skip zone two. So zone two is the sweet spot. And this is a spot that is so easy. It's at 65% of your maximum heart rate. It's actually defined as two millimoles below, mm. below two millimoles if you take a, a lactate test, which we do as well. And it's really easy to do. That's where you want to be training. It's basically when you're walking really fast or running, depending on how fit you are, but you can hold a conversation with another person. So there's two things we want to discuss right now. The effects of cardiovascular training on the brain 
And then I want to talk to you about immunology and the effects of cardiovascular training on cancer. Yes, beautiful, please. beautiful work. So let's talk about cardiovascular training on the brain. Well, when we're engaging in this zone two training, 65% of aerobic capacity, we are releasing trophic factors. We're releasing hormones. We're releasing molecules that are really responsible for the regeneration and growth of the connections of these neurons. So remember how I said earlier that with Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline, we lose the connections. The 5,000 connections per cell go down to 2,000, 1,000, then there's no little dendrites left. And then what do you have? You have pretty much have a dead cell. So we grow new connections with a molecule called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. In fact, Marianne Diamond back in 1960s, early 1960s was the first one to discover this. She she obviously she got um, rats and she subjected the rats one to an environment that was really depressing in a room where they had no wheels to run and not not an enriched environment hmm. then she took the mice and put them in an enriched environment wheel running they had little stairs to climb and what she saw was that over the course of her study she saw that when these mice are placed in an enriched environment they grow the connections. That's what we're looking for. They grow the connections. They also grow the hippocampal volume. Okay, so you're growing bigger hippocampi. Mm. You're also growing new neurons. So BDNF is responsible for this. 